Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York, an important collection of books on presidential history. Recently found a new home in the Roosevelt House Library at Hunter College. The 65 books cover the presidency from John Quincy Adams to Bill Clinton with a special emphasis on Franklin Delano Roosevelt. My guest today is William Vanden Heuvel, founder of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute and the FDR for Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island. He was instrumental in acquiring those presidential books for Roosevelt House. Among his many other accomplishments, Bill served as ambassador to the United Nations, both here and in Geneva, as a special assistant to Attorney General Robert Kennedy. And currently, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. We have plenty of grist for our mill. Next. Mr. Ambassador, it's good to see you. Thank you, Tony. Let's talk a little bit about those books and their importance. They belong to the library of Arthur Schlesinger. Arthur was well. a preeminent historian of America mm -hmm. in the 20th century. He was, wrote wonderful three volumes about Roosevelt. He wrote a wonderful volume about Jack Kennedy. He got the Pulitzer Prize for his volume on Andrew yeah. Jackson. I was the executor of his will, and he wanted very much, if possible, to have certain books placed into a special library. Well, there's nothing better than Roosevelt House on E 65th Street. Yeah. That's where President and Mrs. Roosevelt lived for all their life in New York City. So when Jennifer Rabb succeeded in getting the Roosevelt House designated, the library that she's the president of Hunter. She's president of Hunter. The library in Roosevelt House was the Roosevelt's library. It now has all these books. So it's a wonderful sense to, to go up to the library in Roosevelt House, have Arthur Schlesinger's signature in these books, have this wonderful library dedicated to the presidents, and it gives us a fresh meaning to everything. It reminds us of books. You know, everybody's reading on their phone, doing this. These are heavy books, paper books, mm. hardcover books. And I know how Arthur cherished them himself. I mean, he had lived in a library. He loved books. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been a wonderful addition to Roosevelt House. One of them is yours, uh, on Bobby Kennedy. Right. <laughs> right. I wrote a book on Robert Kennedy after his death. It was published in 1970, and it was called On His Own. Yeah. And it was the years between his becoming attorney general and his death running for the Senate. We'll, we'll come back to that, but I want to talk about FDR with you because he clearly is your North Star in terms of public service. Why? Tony, Franklin Roosevelt, by any estimate, and this, I think, is almost the unanimous opinion of historians, whatever, whatever their background, was the greatest president of the United States in the 20th century. He led our country through its two greatest crises, the Great Depression, which was mm -hmm. the most destructive assault on the economic well-being of free market society, and World War II, which was the ultimate triumph, we thought, over the barbaric forces that threatened democracy everywhere. So Winston Churchill once said of Franklin Roosevelt that he's the greatest man I ever knew. I have had the great honor of participating in a number of ventures that have brought the of President Roosevelt to the forefront of American thinking because the society we live in, the country we know so well, is a country essentially built around the structure that Franklin Roosevelt saw in the four freedoms. Mm -hmm. The four freedoms, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom uh, of uh, worship, religion. freedom from want, freedom from fear. Exactly. Uh, and you've worked 40 years to get the memorial, the four freedoms memorial on Roosevelt Park. But before we talk about the memorial, um, you talk about Franklin Roosevelt's position in our history. I'm reminded, I forgot where I read this, but. Ronald Reagan voted for oh, absolutely for uh, FDR four times. I remember going to see Ronald Reagan 
about the memorial being built in Washington or that we wanted built in Washington. And it was a $50 million number in the federal budget, but nobody ever passed it. So I went to see uh, Roosevelt. The first thing Reagan said to me, I voted four times for Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> Is this when he was president? Yeah, he was he president. told you that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he, and when he, he, was... arra he arranged for that appropriation to build the Roosevelt Memorial in Washington. Was he, the, the Reagan who voted four times for FDR wasn't the Reagan who eventually succeeded to the White he House? Never, he never really was in conflict with Roosevelt and the New Deal. Mm -hmm. he, his enemy, as he saw it, was Lyndon Johnson and the uh, Great, Great Society. Society. But he was always most admiring. As a matter of fact, after Reagan died, <clears throat> there was a move to rename everything in America for Ronald Reagan, <laughs> including the dime, which has, really? which has the Roosevelt yeah, picture sure. on it. Well, of course, it had the Roosevelt picture on it because the dime was the March of Dimes. Which he? Which he was the founder oh, of, in a sense, because he had polio and was severely disabled. And through the March of Dimes, we found the Salk vaccine and the Sabin vaccine. Right. So uh, he... That I think, so Mrs. Reagan, when it was announced that some congressman had introduced legislation to make the dime, the Reagan dime, Mrs. Reagan immediately responded and said that Ronnie, as she called him, was a devoted admirer in, in, uh, of Franklin Roosevelt and wouldn't think in the world of replacing him on that dime. <laughs> so that's how we yeah. saved the Roosevelt dime. That's a good story. Yeah. Um, you were talking about you know, what this country is today as a legacy of, of FDR. And it, it occurred to me to uh, ask you, that, you know, about his philo I mean, philosophy. I mean, he, among, you know, he was foremost in, in, in believing that government had, a, had an obligation to its citizens yes. to make life better, uh, to improve society, social justice, and things like that. Um, that's very different from what country we live in today and, and, and a perception of government. Well, that's a very important point that you make because Roosevelt turned the idea of government around and gave it the positive responsibility to help people with their own lives. When he became president in 1933, 25% of the country was unemployed. There were no welfare services. The, the aged were left without programs of any kind. There was no social security. He faced those problems rather directly. The Republicans had always resisted all of those programs. And he said the role of government is to make this country work. And so he, with WPA and public works programs, CCC, he put America to work again to rebuild itself. WPA uh, built a fair amount of New York. Oh, absolutely. Infrastructure. Yeah, the tunnels, the bridges, the Triborough, all of those are objects that, as a matter of fact, more than half of the infrastructure of the country was built under Roosevelt. Hmm. And today, the, you know, we face a, a very real challenge on infrastructure. We've got to do something about it. If they went back to the Roosevelt era, they would understand how to do it. Well, uh, you know, there's um, a problem getting anything passed <laughs> these days. But you say they'd know how to do it. Well, I, 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 am, I understand what you're saying. But here we have in this region, we have this, infrastructure, this huge infrastructure idea of this second rail tunnel under the uh, Hudson River. And... First, it was thrown aside by the former governor of New Jersey, Christie. And now the president is trying to uh, kill it, apparently, over some peak over Ch uh, Senator Schumer. And you, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but he's certainly not on board when he said during the campaign how he was going to build so much infrastructure. I mean, how do we not have the will to do something like that, that is so necessary. It costs money. Well, yeah. And you can't give away a trillion and a half dollars 
and the so-called tax reform program, and at the same time commit a trillion dollars to rebuilding the country. I think Americans are prepared to rebuild America. And I think they would very much appreciate and admire lead and follow leadership that undertook to say, we inherited an infrastructure and we're going to enhance it. But you point out uh, what Governor Christie did the first week in office. He canceled building that special tunnel. Well, that put the whole metropolitan area back 10 years in mm. terms of trying yeah. to build this place. So it's, it's a constant fight, but, uh, and it, things are even more difficult today because there's so many forces in action. There's so many power centers. There's so much money available against you for whatever you try to do. And the Congress is leaderless. Yeah. And um, America's going to have to answer to itself. You know, one interesting thing, Tony, I'm sure you were moved by it too, was in the response to the terrible crime in Florida and the schools. All these all children. Those children. All those children coming out. And I was so impressed that they referred to themselves as a new generation that's going to do what our parents should have done. And what's your feeling? Well, the NRA has such a lock on no, Congress. not going to do anything now. I mean, the president's already caved in. He, He's so how are they going to how are they going to do with it's their parents? Long, it's a long fight. I think you have to start in the states. You have to get the states to adopt legislation. There's a lot of states that won't do anything, but there are a lot of states that are look at Connecticut. What happened in Connecticut after that school yeah. massacre? They've really now have some very important gun control laws. Nobody's trying to take anybody's gun away from them or to deter hunting, but. What kind of a civilization is it where you walk around the streets with an AK-45, <laughs> an yeah, assault rifle? Assault rifle. Well, we, anyway, had, we had a ban on it. The, but another thing I would mention is young Joe Kennedy, who's a member of Congress now, and mm -hmm. he's a grandson of Robert Kennedy. I was interested in the speech he gave in response to the State of the Union speech. He was chosen to be the speaker. And he said one line that got me particularly was, he said, Mr. President, Go ahead and build your wall. My generation will take it down. Mm. Mm. So that's well, where the fight is developing. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, the memorial on, on Roosevelt Island. Am I wrong, Bill, but, I, you know, I'm a New Yorker for life. I mean, I was born here. Uh, I, I don't get the sense that it's as well known as it should be. Do you? No, but, no, that's I, true, because we don't have money for marketing it, but... We've had over 900,000 visitors. I should tell the audience, this is a, a magnificent uh, a memorial on the very southern tip of Roosevelt Island, designed by uh, Louis, Louis, Louis Kahn. T talk about the design and, well, talk Well, it was determined, and Nelson Rockefeller played an important role in this. Nelson Rockefeller once wrote in a fragment of an autobiography that Franklin Roosevelt was probably the most important person in his life outside of his family. Mm. That's because he introduced Nelson to public responsibility and gave him an appointment in the last years of the uh, Roosevelt administration. In any event, he played a major role, as did John Lindsay, in saying that New York should have a, a memorial to its greatest president. And you've worked 40 years to <laughs> so make I it happen. There. And it finally opened in, what, 2012, was no. it? But you're too young to have been there when 1973, when John Lindsay was mayor, I was Rockefeller was governor. We had 500 people out on Roosevelt Island and dedicated the island to Franklin Roosevelt and renamed it and undertook to build this wonderful, wonderful memorial that Louis Kahn designed. Louis Kahn is one of the greatest architects of the 20th century. I mean, architects everywhere mm -hmm. fear him. So to have the memorial built by Louis Kahn was itself a great attraction. So uh, then Kahn died. Nelson Rockefeller went to Washington as vice president, and the city of New York went bankrupt. So A couple of problems. <laughs> yes, a couple of problems we had to deal with. In 2005, when I took an emeritus role in various enterprises, I undertook to raise the money to build this park. It was $60 million. 
And without government backing, we raised it. Mm. And we built Impressive. it. It opened in 2012. It's a magnificent structure, as you've seen. It's, uh, it's been honored around the world as one of the great structures. It's certainly one of the greatest presidential memorial in the United States. So I hope people uh, will take advantage of the opportunity of visiting. I can't tell you how often I am approached by people in a restaurant or somewhere who thank me for bringing about the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial in Roosevelt Island. It's called the, the, the FDR or, for Freedom or Freedom's uh, Memorial Park. And I, I was wondering... It has a spiritual dimension to it, that park. I, it's really, literally, scores of people have talked to and the. New York Times review of it when it opened said it has brought a new spiritual heart to New York. Mm. So I think people who go out there go out there more than once. And, you know, Roosevelt Island is no, what, less accessible than where the Statue of Liberty is. Get, uh, out, get, out get the, 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 F, the F train and or the, the tram, tram or, you know, drive from Queens. Take anyway. The tram at 60th and 2nd Avenue yes. and it's five minutes away. Yeah, you could just walk right over past the, past the little tennis uh, yeah. place. <laughs> I, I thank you for your compliment about my, you know, my youth, which is not necessarily true. Yes, I covered Nelson Rockefeller in Albany when, when he was governor. Um, anyway, uh, how do you think those freedoms are faring today, those four freedoms, freedom of speech? I think they're in danger. Uh, freedom's always in danger. And I think that's why Thomas Jefferson said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And that's why you have to fight for every, you know, the freedom of the press today. Look at the number of journalists who are murdered around the world. Yep. And another impediment to free expression is the fact that our media now are owned and controlled by very few companies. Very large, very few large. and very large companies. Freedom of religion. Religion is at the center of a divided, bitter world. Freedom, freedom from what? We have 55 million people in the status of refugees and fleeing. And freedom from fear, we have President Trump meeting with the head of North Korea, trying desperately to stop an atomic bomb. Right. I was going to bring that up. I'm glad you did. Um, you served in the UN, and, and you've been all over the world. And um, diplomacy is, is something quite, you're something quite, you're quite familiar with. At one point, when Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State, President Trump ridiculed him for suggesting that the United States and North Korea should talk. I think he used, I think the president used it, something like, good luck talking to little rocket man. Yeah. Now Tillerson is gone. Now Trump is going to talk, apparently, to Little Rocket Man. I mean, uh, I'm glad he's doing that. I think a direct, I think talk, talk is very important. Negotiation, diplomacy, war should be the very last option. Of course. The greatest enemy of democracy is war. Just an endless war. Look at Afghanistan. 18 years we've been involved in the war. War bankrupts a nation, takes away our best young children leads to all kinds of frictions in the world. So I think that the president's uh, talking to, it's a big victory for the president of North Korea yeah. to have the president of the United States agree so readily to talking to him. Now the question is, has anybody thought out what they're gonna say? <laughs> because it's very hard for me to imagine, frankly, uh, the North Koreans giving up their nuclear arsenal. I can see where they might agree to capping it. We'll stop the tests, we'll do this. That's a possibility, remote though it is. By giving up what they have, the Iranian ambassador once said to me after uh, George Bush's speech, you may remember where he said the axis of evil, yes. where he identified, he said to Russia. me, your president has just identified my country, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea as an axis of evil. He says, we know that you have invaded Iraq. We note that your army is on our border. We notice that you don't touch North Vietnam. 
And that has to be because it has the nuclear weapons. So with the mere, mere presence of nuclear weapons, North Korea has been able to stave off and have one of the worst tyrannies in the world as its government. It's going to be very tough to get them to give up on that, in my judgment. But uh, I hope the president leaves in place the agreement with Iran. I thought that was a major achievement, and so does the rest of the world. And if he, if he abandons that, I, I would hold even less hope mm. for the discussions with the North. Let's go to another part of the world, Russia. I, I saw you at a um, conference, I'm not sure, I can't remember the name, but I think it was about two years ago. And you were talking about Russia and you said that um, the greatest obligation we have, the United States, is to work with Russia. And I'm wondering if two years later you still think that given their assault on our, uh, you know, democracy in the last election and all the other things we're hearing, how do you well, view... Tony, one thing I think you have to remember that all of the things that are being said about Putin, if they are true and probably are, most of them are, the United States hasn't sat by idly for the last 50 years. No. We have intervened in elections and in the choice of governments in many different places. All over the world, yeah. I, my position on Russia is, is this, that the United States in its own interest needs a constructive relationship with Russia. But you've got to end the Syrian war. 500,000 people have been killed there. Countries destroyed. Well, I noticed that Max Boot, who's a very outstanding uh, commentator for the Council of Foreign Relations, said the other day, let's face reality. And he's a right-wing uh, pol political thinker. Let's face the reality that the United States is not going to intervene to save Syria. That being the case, let's understand that we have to have peace and stop the killing. Now, the second thing is, unless you have an agreement with the Russians on Syria, you don't, can't stop the enormous migration that has almost destroyed yeah. the governments of Western Europe. That's crucial to America's uh, freedom and interest to have Western Europe survive. So that has to be the, thirdly, Russia is a superpower and nuclear weapons equal to our own. And Putin's just announced that he's got a whole new generation. Mm. We've got to keep pressing to control the growth of nuclear weapons. These weapons are going to be miniaturized, and you're going to have people being able, rogues in rogue states, threatening the peace of the world with nuclear weapons. So I think it's in our great interest to, to have a working relationship with the Russians. And how you do that now, it's awfully difficult. Awfully difficult. We talked some about politics today, uh, and I'm reminded that you... Uh, engaged <laughs> in politics some years back, 1960, uh, running for Congress on what was then called the Silk Stocking District on the east side, upper east side of Manhattan, against a fellow named Lindsay, who was the incumbent. I just thought it might be fun for a moment to compare politics 1960 with what goes on today. What was that race like vis-a-vis -vis what goes on now? Well, as I think back at, at it, Tony, it was, certainly was simpler. I mean, John Lindsay and I faced each other directly. We must have knocked on 50,000 doors in our district. People joined committees that were related to issues. We had public debates. I mean, it was a very uh, wonderful thing in, in, in that context and much, much less expensive. It, you're saying it was, the emphasis was on issues. Yeah. Yeah, Which we and, well, personality is always critical. And I remember walking through Central Park often, I was shaking hands with voters, and the voter would say, "Mr. Vandenhove, we'd like to vote for you, but you know, John Lindsay's going to be the next president." We, <laughs> <laughs> and he was, you know, he, he was Hollywood handsome, sure, and he was a, a very good guy. He appointed me to several positions in his administration afterward, and. I think the present summary of, of Lindsay is very unfair. I think he was a much better mayor than 
some people are willing to give them credit. You, for. you say it was a lot less expensive. What, what did it cost? What did you spend? Eighty thousand dollars. Really? <laughs> Eighty thousand. In a race that was a national race. Yeah, it had a national focus. Eighty thousand yeah. dollars. Eighty thousand dollars wouldn't buy what one day in a in a yeah, race. A day. We don't have enough time really to go into this in in any depth. But you mentioned Lindsay appointing you to some positions. One was Commissioner of Corrections. And I wonder what you think uh, about reform of the prison system. Our prisons are failing. Uh, they're over, there are too many people in you prison. Know, I'm not so sure that's true. Really? Uh, when I was chairman of the Board of Correction after Lindsay appointed me, there were 25,000 prisoners in the New York City system in prison. Today there's 9,000. But do you think people are in prison for crimes that could be handled other way? In other words, for yeah. less important things than we should be sending people to prison, drug possession? Uh, you can't send people to prison for marijuana, although in many states they do. There are people in the southern prisons who are there for 10, 20 year sentences for selling four marijuana reefers, whatever they call them. No, I think the prison system has an opportunity. It, it's, it's very tough to run the New York City prison system. Well, I meant, when I, when I posed the question, I meant nationwide, it seems like our prison system is, is failing. I mean, well, we, crime is down significantly. It is down nationwide. Nationwide. And there are many reasons for that, and we could do a whole other program on that. Our prisons are much too brutal, and they don't serve the purpose that they should, which is rehabilitation. Most people who are in prison are going to get out and go back to their communities. The task of those who run the prisons is to use that time and that money to help them come back into the community so they're no longer a threat. That's not happening. That's not happening. So and, in, and in this city, we have a place called Rikers Island, and, and many, I'm, I don't know what percentage, of the people in Rikers Island, it's, it's not the majority, but many of those prisoners haven't even had a trial yet. They're oh, just awaiting right. trial. Well, that's the judicial system. I mean, there's, there's a lot of problems <coughs> that center on things. That, that fre frequently lawyers delay the trial. Yes. Because yeah. the witnesses don't show up and this happens and so you get a much lighter sentence at the end of it. The bail system should be reorganized. You shouldn't be in prison because you don't have $200 to put up for your freedom. You should, people now want to close Rikers Island. Well, everything comes in a circle in reform. Rikers Island came about because people did not want prisons in their local neighborhoods. Of course, and still don't. But now, how are you going to get rid of Rikers Island unless you put back those prisons? Mr. Ambassador, we, there's so much more we could talk about, and I wish we had the time. It's so good to see you. So glad to see you, Tony. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We will see you next time.